Lana, thank you so much for joining me today on the Edge of Comfort podcast. How are you doing? I'm doing great. How are you? <laughs> doing well. I'm really glad to uh, have you on, and I want to thank you for your persistence in following up with me on email. <laughs> I uh, I know I kind of kept saying, oh, yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll email you back, and kind of got uh, caught up in some other things in life. And uh, so I'm glad you were persistent, and we finally got this together, and uh, I'm looking forward to our conversation today. Me too, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so you are most of the time traveling full time and kind of working on your own business through, I guess, wherever you are in the world. So um, I know your your parents are from Greece and you frequent there pretty often. Now you said you're back home in, um, in South Carolina or North yeah. South Carolina. Yeah. And then uh, your partner is from Puerto Rico. So you kind of go those places maybe most frequently or. Um, I guess, where is on the docket next for you that you are most excited about, if you have plans that far ahead? <laughs> um, yeah, so we will go to Puerto Rico for about a month and a half when we leave here and visit um, Jay's family. And then our plan is to spend six months in Mexico. Um, so we like to where to live and all of this, but that's the plan. And then... Um, I will definitely be going back over to Greece for a little bit after that, but kind of unsure how it all looks right now. <laughs> okay. Do you think you'll, I know you have a, uh, a kind of a trip and workshop that you're leading in Greece in August of 2020. Do you think you'll get there before that? Um, I'll probably just go at the start of August and visit my family and then lead the trip. So yeah, I think it won't be until August. Okay. Well, uh, that is definitely something we'll be talking about today, and I think Greece as a whole, not so much maybe as a destination and you know what, where to go and what to see, but more so on the culture and the impact that it's had on you. Mm -hmm. um, so I think to start, a good place would maybe be kind of taking it way back. Um, I'll give a little bit of context and have that lead into my first question, and please feel free to expand on that, and as I'm sure we will throughout the conversation, but... Um, so your parents are both Greek and your dad was originally, he was the first one to immigrate here with your grandparents and his parents when he was relatively young, I think around like 20, 21. Is that right? It was actually like 13 or 14. Oh, wow. Okay. So even younger. Okay. Mm -hmm. So then he went back to Greece at a, a certain point and met your mom there and they got married and came back to the U S. Yeah. Um, and then... So then you're born in the U.S., yeah. and so growing up with two Greek immigrant parents living in the U.S., it seems like they kind of had a pretty set idea of what they wanted your life to look like, or maybe career-wise and what you should be doing. Mm -hmm. On one end, you have your dad who is running his own restaurant and is maybe expecting you to take it over, and... Mm -hmm you eventually help him realize that that's not what you want to do. And while he seemed a little reluctant at first, he eventually came around to the idea and understood it is what it sounds like. Mm -hmm. And then your mom, on the other hand, thought more that you should take a uh, more stable and secure career path, more financially lucrative. I think mm -hmm. maybe architecture was on the books at one point. Mm -hmm. um, and then you have your own idea of what you want to do that is pretty different from both of their ideas. And so my question with this long intro is, and it's a question that you actually posed in uh, your HuffPost article about mm -hmm. growing up with two immigrant parents, was you know, how, how do you answer this question of whether you should follow your parents' own legacy and the kind, kind of the path that they've set up for you immigrating to America versus following your own legacy and your own idea of what your life should look like? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a really difficult thing for a lot of children of immigrants to navigate it's sort of the which route do I take the balance between the two. There's definitely a pressure to um, do what parents expect. And I and also because a lot of people who have immigrated to the U.S. are coming from um, very collectivist cultures where um, family is really important and carrying on a family business is kind of just a norm and expectation. And so 
I definitely felt that pressure and that weight. And from the time I was really young, um, I just always heard about how, you know, I was going to inherit my dad's business when I was older. And when I was younger, that didn't necessarily scare me because I thought, oh, okay, like it's a successful business. That's nice. Like I won't have to like really worry so much about things. It felt almost like secure. Um, but then as I got older and I started working there, I was like, no, I can't do this. <laughs> like, I really, really didn't want that life. And I'm this person who just like everything I do has to feel really meaningful to me. And for me, that didn't feel meaningful. And I just started to feel really trapped by the idea and suffocated by the idea. Um, and I would avoid working there. I would try to find like every other job that I could. And yeah, it just became really clear that it wasn't part of my plan. And, um, and then right on the other hand, I had my mom who, you know, just really wanted me to choose a, a path that would be really like financially lucrative, whether it was a doctor or a lawyer or whatever. Like, I think she kind of was okay with my idea for architecture for a while there because I did really love that. Um, but yeah, it was just like, I knew that if, if I did something that followed their path, I would become bitter and resentful. And I just didn't want that. And I don't know, I'm kind of also like a very independent, strong willed, stubborn sort of person. <laughs> and I just kind of have to do what I feel is right for me. Otherwise, like, I will be miserable, and probably everyone around me will be miserable. Um, so yeah, it was I mean, it wasn't easy because I felt guilty a lot of times. Um, my sister has decided to take over my dad's business. And like, I had a lot of guilt around that, just assuming that she did it out of obligation, which now I know is not the case, but that was hard for me to think about. And I don't know. And then you worry that your parents, you know, maybe they're not going to be proud of you or they're going to think that you were unappreciative. I definitely felt that a lot that, um, that they may have thought I was unappreciative of, of things they had done for me or choices they had made. And for me, it was, it was never about not being grateful. It was about making the most of the opportunity that they did create for me because I almost felt like they made sacrifices so that I would have choices and my choice was to live a life that had meaning for me. So, yeah. That's a really good way to put it, that they gave you the opportunity of choice. Whereas mm -hmm. in, you might think they're giving, like in when people are trying to think of immigration and parents providing a better opportunity for the parents, well, like you said, that opportunity could simply be the choice to make your own decisions and not have to go into a certain field or a certain area of life. So I guess going back a little bit with that guilt you felt mm -hmm. making your own choice and maybe at the time they didn't quite understand that that was how you viewed it and having this choice or I don't know at which point in the timeline where you mm -hmm. started having that mindset and seeing it from that perspective. But early on when you are experiencing this guilt and probably still a little bit of pressure and maybe feuding a bit with your parents um, and they're still wanting you to go this way and you want to go this way, like what was your mindset at that point? How are you trying to navigate that field and still kind of find your own avenue that you felt good about, but also having these feelings of guilt in, in the back of your mind? Mm -hmm. um, mm. <laughs> well, to be honest, like there's a big part of me that, that is kind of, rebellious in the sense that I really reject the status quo or I reject what is expected of me like in kind of all ways in my life I have this need to forge my own path it's just like the way I am in almost everything and so even though I I felt that I think 
that need to forge my path was still stronger and greater. And like this need to do something that fulfilled me still outweighed the guilt. So it was like, I felt it, but I was still able to not let it like consume me or, and I mean, it's not that there was never conflict because of it with my parents. And I mean, there was conflict with my parents over like a lot of stuff. So not just that. Um, But yeah, I just think that especially with the choices I've made to like, I'm just going to go live abroad or I'm just going to do this. Or I'm very like, I, I get an idea in my head and I just make it happen. And I think they realized like, okay, like we really can't (laughs) control her anyway. Like, so, yeah, I mean, I don't even know if that answers your question. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, so it seems like the, like, in a way, you, you mentioned earlier about, like, not resenting yourself, like, you needed, or you would have resented yourself if you had taken the path of that your parents expected you to take, so it's like that, that resentment you would have felt for yourself would have been so powerful and painful that it would have been, like, awful for you to pursue that, so you chose, mm-hmm. obviously, what felt to you in a way where you wouldn't resent yourself and you'd be proud of what you were doing no matter which way you did end up going as long as it was true to you and your values and your beliefs essentially yeah if if i understood Mm -hmm. it correctly yeah okay Mm -hmm. and so something i I think you mentioned on in your writings on your website is um the feeling of having enough or or being enough and Mm -hmm. when you were maybe younger or in this path trying to figure out you felt like no matter what you were doing, it was never enough. I think the example you you used was you got you were third in your high school for grades, and mm-hmm. your mom still was like kind of upset that you weren't first or second. And mm-hmm. so even you kind of had these feelings where even if you were to choose the path that they expected you to, it still wouldn't be enough no matter what you did. Exactly. So <laughs> yeah. So could you speak on that a little bit more and like kind of how you? realize this and the realization of enough and and then I have a follow-up to that as well um I guess more related to today but yeah yeah so I could see that in patterns as I was growing up like even when I was doing what was expected or even when I was trying to to do whatever I thought was right in their eyes or would make them proud it still never felt like it was enough like there was still always criticism or um just like the the expectation just went higher and somehow the bar was continued to be raised and I was like I don't even know if it's possible to go that high like I just you know yeah I just felt like I, I can't do it and so this continued on and when I um I ultimately went to graduate school because I felt like I had to um Granted, I ended up, I studied something I really loved and I enjoyed it and I think it was a good decision for me, Um, but I still did it out of a sense of obligation and uh, yeah, like I got into an argument with my parents on the day of my graduation and, and I don't know, it was like everything clicked for me in that day, especially like around the things that they said And I just realized, like, I, yeah, it doesn't matter. I could do everything they ever wanted me to. And I'm still not going to feel like I'm meeting their expectations or I'm doing enough. So for me, that was like, it was almost just like this complete revolution of like, fuck it. I am seriously doing whatever I want. And (laughs) And I literally, like, told them maybe a week later, I'm moving to Asia. Like, it was just, I was so done at that point. And I, and I just, from then on, I, I never even tried to meet their expectations anymore. I just did what was right for me. And that was it. Was that, a, like, a very freeing feeling for you? Did that, do you feel like that changed a lot in your life or in what you did in your actions or was it still more gradual? Um, I think, I think there was a sense of relief and like a newfound sense of freedom. And especially when I left, like 
I don't know, those next couple of years, I, I learned a lot and I grew a lot, but a lot of other stuff also came to the surface. So, um, like what happened that day really, it really had a profound impact on me. It was very hurtful for me. And so I started to have nightmares, uh, like, related to that argument that I had with him and like it just brought up a lot for me and it made me realize um how much anger I had pushed down and how I was just really really angry about stuff um so that propelled me to I don't know to just like go on this whole journey of self-healing, which I have now been on for seven to eight years of just trying to work through all of the, I don't know, like the impact that my relationship with them has had on me and the way that I express myself or repress myself or whatever it may be. So, I mean, it was, it was like a really pivotal experience I guess Mm -hmm. so with that self-healing journey you've been on um where do you think would be a good place to start kind of talking about that would it be around like cultural conditioning and kind of how you started to recognize some of that and break some of those beliefs and and the things that were holding you back or um would there be another like good place to start where you felt like you kind of began that journey and started to either tools to use or things that helped you recognize what the pain that was in your life and how you could start healing it. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I guess, (laughs) um, I mean, yeah, it was because of of that that I really started to, um, I don't know, seek out different methods of trying to become more aware of my conditioning and to heal things. Um, so there was a lot of like spiritual exploration that began, and I had been, um, I had identified as a Christian and before in my life. Um, but then I had let go of that identity, which is like a whole other story. Um, and so this was like a different kind of, of search of trying to understand things. I mean, I don't even know what to say, Lee. So, (laughs) (laughs) um, yeah, I just, I started, I started doing Reiki and I started, um, exploring different types of therapy and I started doing inner child work and, getting, um, soul readings with a lady. Um, she does them remotely for me and just tapping into, I guess my subconscious, um, and figuring out sort of the limiting beliefs that I had been holding on to and that were impacting me. So did a lot of these limiting beliefs come from your culture and your upbringing where maybe we can take a step back for a little bit and, you know, growing up, you were, you mentioned you're kind of stuck between two cultures. Your, your parents are very Greek and you're growing up in technically a Greek household, but you're in America and living in that culture. But then you're also going back to Greece pretty often to see family and maybe stay there for a while. So kind of stuck between these two cultures and learning different things from each or each culture and I guess expectations from each kind of influencing you how did growing up with that split create some of these these conditionings and and possible pain points I guess mm-hmm. um yeah well because with that too that feeling of not being enough played a role in that or the feeling of being too much of something or not enough of something else so Um, I was really influenced and shaped by both cultures, which are very different from one another. And so when I was in the U S, um, in my American life, I just like, I didn't fit in because I had all of these Greek qualities that people thought were kind of weird. Like I was very dramatic and very passionate and very 
heated and like fiery and just, um, I don't know, in a sense, I was like too much. And then I would go to Greece and I had all these American qualities of being super independent and not really wanting to always be with groups of people and um, not always wanting to partake in the big celebrations and more kind of keeping to myself and maybe I wasn't social enough. And so in that context, I always felt like I was not enough of things. Um, and so, yeah, I just felt like people didn't really understand me in either place. I felt really misunderstood. That was like just a huge thing for me, feeling misunderstood. Um, just because people made all kinds of assumptions about me based on the fact that I might feel shy in one context or the fact that I was like overly expressive in another. So I, it just felt like I don't fit here anywhere. Um, and at the same time though, having, being exposed to these two completely different contexts really helped me sort of open my mind and see, you know, these like very different sets of values and how people live super differently and, um, I don't know, it was very, I think it just also allowed me to begin to open my mind to what I would later discover that it's all just a construct, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, that is a very unique part of like your, your journey and your childhood is most people never e may never even get that other perspective of a different culture. And especially to that degree, um, mm -hmm. like me, for example, I, my first true international experience was studying abroad in college, which is probably the first time for many people in America. Um, and it's still only a small subset of people do do a cultural exchange thing like that. And that I remember coming back from that and just being like, oh my gosh, it was really when I got back to America where I was like, whoa, this is weird. Mm -hmm. Like you really mm -hmm. kind of see that, but you know, that was only four months and you adjust back to American culture quickly. So having that as you're growing up and kind of trying to make sense of that, you know, did you, was that just kind of like normal, your, like your reality normal or like you mentioned just being displaced and not really feeling misunderstood in each place. So like, how did you make sense of that as a kid? And, you know, when you're one, just trying to make sense of the world, but now you've also got these two cultures that are kind of competing against each other. Mm -hmm. Um... I mean, to be honest, I don't know that I did make sense of it. I think that I just almost felt like a victim of my circumstances in a sense. Um, yeah, I mean, I really don't think it was until much later and being able to reflect from a more like mature, experienced place that I, that I was able to make sense of it. I think just in it, I just realized like, okay, these people are really different than these people and um, life is really different here than it is over here. And there were things that I liked and disliked about each, but um, yeah, I don't think that I really comprehended what was happening exactly <laughs> how it was shaping me <laughs> okay fair um <laughs> <laughs> yeah it makes sense so i guess like you started going i guess kind of back a little bit when you did start going on your own path and kind of discovering cultural conditioning and um i guess could you walk us through a little bit of the path you did end up taking and that was different from your parents and, and why you did decide, or I guess how you got to where you are today. And, um, and you know, if you look at your website, you describe yourself as, uh, um, I want to get it right. I think it was, uh, intercultural educator, cultural consultant and facilitator. 
So, you know, what led you to this area and to work on your own business all around the world and, and how, what different steps did you take and, and studies and, and places to get you where you are? Mm-hmm. Um, well, uh, so we'll, we'll start way back. Um, when I was in high school, um, all of these things that we just talked about, these feelings of not being enough and feeling misunderstood and not belonging. Um, I really developed this belief that I was unlovable or that I didn't deserve to be loved. And I became really depressed and I struggled for about a year or two with, with deep depression and suicidal ideation. And then I, um, I befriended somebody in art school that I was in and he was really supportive and really helped me through that darkness and um, like just really made me feel like, okay, I can work through this and it's okay and I don't need to take my life and everything will be fine. Um, and then he actually killed himself. Uh, and that was just, uh, I don't know, like a devastating event, especially because I had really no idea what he was going through, especially like he had been there for me and he knew what I was going through, but he had never shared anything with me if he had shown it, I was too self-absorbed to see it. Um, and so it was really like a wake up call for me. One about how sort of self-involved we can be and how we can really overlook other people and what's happening in their lives. Um, but two also that, so many of us suffer in silence and so many of us feel unwanted and so many of us feel like we're not enough. Um, and it's like, we, we share that, but we still suffer alone. Um, and so because of that experience, I really wanted to create a space for people to feel safe and understood and accepted. And, I had, you mentioned before this, this path of architecture. So I had actually applied in college for a program in architecture. Um, but because of this experience, I kept questioning that and questioning that. And just before school started, I changed my major to sociology and psychology um, because I decided that I wanted to become a therapist. Um, but I still had resistance to that because at the time I really, I didn't know how to set sort of emotional boundaries in the sense that I was always just taking on other people's feelings and carrying them with me. And I, I was worried that I wouldn't really be able to do something like therapy. I thought it would be too heavy for me. Um, so yeah, I think there was just a part of me that was really almost like trying to find a way out. <laughs> um, and at the same time, I joined this cultural exchange community in my university where international students and domestic students live together. And the purpose of that was was to develop friendships between the two and for us to learn from each other and um, learn about different parts of the world. And I really loved that experience so much and I went on my first like solo trip during that time and my mind started to be opened even more to just different worldviews and perspectives. Um, so I debated a lot between getting an MSW and doing a master's in something else. Um, is, is MSW master's in social work? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So to pursue that, the route of therapy or not. And in the end, I decided to get a master's in cultural anthropology instead. Um, and so I did that. And then 
this is when I then moved to Asia um, after graduating. And I ended up working for an organization we were designing and facilitating leadership development programs in international schools. Um, and so I was doing a lot of curriculum development, a lot of facilitation, a lot of program design and delivery. And because it was leadership development and the way we had designed the curriculum, it was very much about um, self-discovery and self-awareness um, community building and community development, and then global citizenship and global engagement. And so this was kind of like my life. And then when I left that role, I ended up going into a position at a university in the U.S. And I was running um, all of the intercultural program on that intercultural programming on that university campus. Um, and so working closely with student groups and running events to highlight their culture and doing different kind of cross cultural building activities and running cultural exchange programs and taking students abroad. So, um, and I continued in that role, I think like my focus always kind of came back to to the self-discovery and self-awareness pieces. And I was really focused on that in the work that I did with students. Um, and uh, students started asking me to run retreats from them outside of my work hours. So on the weekends, <laughs> I started doing that with them um, because, well, a lot of them just said like, okay, we do leadership kind of stuff all the time on campus, but nobody does it like you. And so they were just coming to me and then one student group would tell another student group and then I was just like constantly working. Um, but I loved it. I really loved it a lot. And I just decided that I wanted to be able to serve people in that kind of way, in the way that allowed me to really focus on what I wanted because I still had, you know, restrictions what I could do in my regular hours. I couldn't do anything I wanted, right? So um, that's when I decided to leave my role and create my own business. Um, and through all of this and through the healing work that I did on myself that we touched on earlier, I just started to really feel like the reason that... Um, Maybe a lot of the work we do with build, trying to build bridges across cultures or diversity and inclusion work or intercultural training, whatever it might be, for me, I feel like it's not super effective in the long term, the way that it's done. And that's because I think we're focusing on the symptoms of the issue. So the division between us being a symptom of a different issue, the conflict between us, the misunderstanding between cultures, um, the oppression, prejudice. For me, I feel like that is all a manifestation of what's happening inside of us. And it's we reject other people because we have rejected ourselves and we are separate from other people because we are separate from who we are because through the conditioning we learn to to become somebody else and we deny our truths so often and we live out these limiting beliefs and these inner child beliefs that we develop and the unhappiness that exists within us is projected out into the world and so this is really the approach that I kind of take and why I have such a big focus on self-discovery and self-awareness in my work. Um, and it's interesting because I have, in the last year, I have just felt um, like I'm still, in a sense, denying something in me. And that is that I feel myself being called back to the original thing that I kind of ran away from. And so my, my work and my business is really taking a shift and that will, that will really be seen in 2020 to 
to really focus on that individual work and helping people heal themselves um, in pursuit of healing the collective. So doing the inner work so that we can better do the outer work. Um, so yeah, that's where I am now. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So I have a few follow-up questions. Okay. I'm sorry. Guess, it's not- <laughs> no, no, it's, it's very it, like, thank you for walking through that. I mean, it helps, you know, put the picture together. And, um, so with when you talk about these symptoms of across cultures and why we have these differences, do you have like an example? Like, I don't know if I quite understood what you meant by like these symptoms between us. Yeah, so I feel like um, prejudice and discrimination and oppression and like just global systems of un- injustice are are a symptom of sort of what I I don't want to use the word broken because that's not the right word, but um, they're just a symptom of the unhappiness that exists within us as individuals and the unworthiness that we carry. And it becomes projected into the world, into the way we treat other people, into the way that we deal with difference um, and what we don't understand. Does that make sense? Yeah, that does. So these problems aren't necessarily because just I see you from a different culture and just for no reason I just hate your culture because whatever, it's because there's something within me that I don't like about myself, so I'm projecting that onto you in a way, and that's causes, and when that's done at a mass scale, that is what produces this global hatred or racism or or things like that. Yeah. So we even see it when we talk about like spiritual healing or personal development work. We talk about other people being a mirror, right? They reflect to us the things we don't like in ourselves. We even talk about it on, in an academic context, we talk about the proximate other. So it's like the other that you feel hatred toward Actually, the more alike, the more like you they are, the more hatred you feel toward them because it's almost like you are projecting, like you're seeing what you don't like in yourself in the other. And so it's, yeah, but in essence, I just think it's like you can't, how can you create a space to accept other people when you have literally been taught not to accept yourself. Like, how can you accept other people when you don't accept yourself? And we are taught not to accept ourselves in a lot of ways where, and that's where the conditioning comes in. We are taught who to be. And most of us either suppress parts of ourselves or create parts of ourselves. We wear masks because it's like, we don't feel safe being ourselves. And if we're not safe, how can we create safe environments? Because we don't know what that looks like. Yeah. So how, I just forgot what I was going to say. How do you, I guess, recognize these parts of yourself that maybe you've been taught and aren't really you or these, these areas that, um, yeah, that, that we've been taught, like, at mm-hmm. such a young age that we don't even realize are something that has been taught to us like unconsciously. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So what I try to work through with people when we're doing all this self-discovery and self-awareness work is, is first and foremost becoming more aware of how we are conditioned by culture, becoming more aware of how deeply our cultural environment is embedded within us. It is part of our subconscious, how we take on different messages and expectations. And so this is why I think intercultural learning is a really valuable tool for self-discovery because it allows us to see the different ways that different people in different societies have been conditioned and going back to this idea of like, it's all a construct. And so, um, I I first do that. I first help people see. I have a whole like series of activities that I do with people and and reflective sort of questions that I ask to to really unveil, I think, um, how deeply 
shaped we are by our cultural context and our environment. Um, and from there, we start to work on identifying what might be inner child beliefs that we've developed. And from there, identifying limiting beliefs, how those beliefs hold us back from other things. And, um, and just, th there's also a lot about sort of reading between the lines and listening to what people are saying and asking the right questions to get them to go deeper into, into self realizations. Um, if that makes sense. So like, for example, with one of the things I offer the intercultural intensive, like I just did a session with somebody yesterday and she took an assessment that showed, um, that when it comes to intercultural cross-cultural engagement, she has very low emotional resilience. Um, and so we just, we talked for an hour and a half until, until we uncovered where does that actually come from? And it's rooted in her childhood and it's rooted in beliefs that she took on, um, through interactions with her parents and how it made her sort of completely unable to set any kind of boundaries. So now she's working on, we created a plan for her to work on, how to to feel more comfortable setting boundaries and to see that she is allowed to set boundaries because she deserves to be respected because there was almost this element of like her belief that she developed was that she didn't deserve to be respected and and that's why she never was able to set boundaries or enforce them and so like we got through to that, you know? Does yeah. That make oh. yeah. It's like, here was the surface level of it. But yes. like you said, that just might be a little kind of a symptom of a much deeper rooted cause and kind of the, the real cause of that happening and that belief. Yeah. So that's got to be pretty intense for people to discover. Like, you know, it's something you don't even necessarily know about yourself until you suddenly do. Right. Like, so I guess what are some of the other examples of, of things you've seen uncovered or some of the more like profound ones either in, in your life or in other people you've helped work with? Mm -hmm. um, something that actually is kind of uh, common among people, like say we're talking about a similar thing where they do the same kind of assessment, is that they tend to score low in positive regard and positive regard is um sort of how likely you are to assume the best about somebody who's different from you um and so we always trace that back to somebody actually having developed issues with trusting people in general and usually that is rooted in an experience of somehow being abandoned or having somebody like leave them or having somebody not be present in their lives. And so they project that and just kind of assume that people can't be trusted because of that experience they had. And that impacts their ability to connect with people and to to create relationships, like to develop relationships with people because they just fear being abandoned again. Mm. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> like, I, so you kind of touched on this with the last example, then how do you begin to, so first is, you know, the realization of this happening. And this is something that you actually wrote about, um, like after recognize after just recognizing kind of this conditioning or this past experience that's causing this you know limiting belief or whatever, it seems like that's really when the hard work starts happening and the more in intense and maybe um, uncomfortable work, kind of trying to recognize who you are without this this thing you probably don't want a part of your life, so. Um, and I, I think in your life, you, you mentioned this caused a good series, not good, but a series <laughs> of, uh, of identity crises. So <laughs> like when, when these are happening, what are you trying to rebuild? Like, are you trying to put something in place of those or just like 
totally destroy him and then you figure out a path from there like how do you deal with these suddenly your whole world could be crumbling down you're like oh my gosh where do i go from here yeah uh yeah it is really hard um and you're right like for me well i feel like i have an identity crisis like once or twice a year of just like oh god like who am i really and (laughs) because i just realize all these things and then and yeah it's it's not easy and i think that a lot of what i try to help people through too is the way that we relate to identity because we do become so attached to identity and it can become so hard to let it go um and we become attached to yeah to the things that actually hurt us and we don't know how who we are without them even though we don't want them in our lives it's like even people who who struggle with anxiety and hate their anxiety it's almost like when they recognize what causes it it's really hard to let it go because it's like, you don't know who you are anymore without the anxiety or without the depression or without the, whatever it might be, because those things are actually like manifestations of suppressed emotion. Um, and so you're inhibiting yourself from experiencing what you're feeling and it's, evolving into all these other things that are negatively impacting your life and then it's it's like we have ways to move past them but it is really hard for people to do it because right when you spend your whole life being a certain way or because our our brains literally become wired to need to just need whatever feeling we've given them or experience we've given them. So even when we're suffering, our brains start to look for the suffering. Like it's part of how, of how our, our neurons wire together. Um, and so it really is about literally rewiring your brain, um, which is like a whole process that we have to go through. But yeah, I mean, I would say that it's, it's identity crisis that people struggle with a lot. And I think I'm able to help people with that because I've gone through it so many times (laughs) (laughs) and I've just developed kind of a different way to see identity and to, to not be so attached to it and to let it, to learn how to let it go. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. So how, like, so if I kind of understood correctly, it's almost our brains convince us that it's almost worse even so even if we identify with something like anxiety or or depression and and we know it's not something we want to have in our life but we don't know what the alternative is necessary and like that uncertainty of just potentially being lost and at least we kind of have like this thing even though it's bad we kind of have that to fall back on and try to get help with and it's almost harder to try to find an alternative in a way Yeah. Yeah. Because I don't know if you've heard, it's like the, the famous saying in neuroscience, but, um, in neurons that fire together, wire together. I haven't heard that, but please explain. (laughs) (laughs) Um, so yeah, basically that when we think certain things over and over, or we like, whether it's the stories we tell ourselves or, the sort of emotions that we feel or don't feel, um, we are training our brain to like, to become attached to that. So, oh, how do I explain this? The neurons in the brain, the messages that we are sending the brain, like it doesn't actually know the difference between reality and like whatever we're just making up. So if we tell ourselves a story over and over, the neurons that are receiving that information, they are firing together until they gradually are wired together. It's like they, they exist. Oh my God, how do I say it? (laughs) They operate as though 
that story we've told ourselves is actually true because they don't know the difference. Um, and so we feel like if I tell myself that I'm unworthy over and over and over, like my brain believes that and my brain operates under that assumption and it literally is shaped to to act in ways that reflect that belief okay yeah you're basically no whether the thing you are telling yourself or believing is true or not it's going to be true to you because of the way your brain is going to essentially wire itself and start working Mm mm-hmm Oh my gosh. So, <laughs> I mean, and it's and it's even cross culturally, our brains literally they they take different shape and form. Like the wires are different because of the conditioning that we receive. So because our brains are plastic, so plastic not as like, you know, the kind that can't be recycled plastic, but Plastic as in they're, they're highly uh, malleable and adaptive to their environment. And so, you know, the way that my brain operates as an American, the way that it has been wired to, to receive information, to process information, is very different than, say, someone who is in China just because, because the values and that they're like ingrained in that wiring. So for example, you can even see it in the way people conceive of, um, things, the way that they describe things or the way that they, um, identify things. So people from more individualistic cultures, they will talk about things as objects. Let's take this as an example. Okay. So we have the concept of, of time we, we objectify concepts in individualistic societies because we've been taught like to see everything as a thing and it based on this individualistic thinking. And so time for us is time is money, time can be wasted, time can be lost. Um, whereas in more collectivist cultures, they see time as a concept, as this flowing thing that has no importance in the sense, this is why a lot of people in collectivist cultures are always late because they don't perceive time the same way. Um, (laughs) Late. (laughs) Um, So, and, and it's also like in the Middle East, let's say when, when people are always like, Oh, inshallah, they say God willing for everything. Like they don't make commitments because they know that they're not actually in control over time. Whereas in the West, we think we have control over time. Mm. So it's just like a totally different way of relating to the world. And that's, that's because of how the brain is processing things. Yeah. And so, and neither of these sides are necessarily right or wrong. It's just the way that their brain is wired because of the culture that they live in and have grown up in and have essentially created their reality and what's important in their values. Yes. Oh my gosh. This is a doozy right now. (laughs) But so, I mean, so not all of this is bad though, right? All this like cultural conditioning, like some of it's got to be good, right? And and teach you good things, hopefully. Well, yes. I mean, (laughs) in a lot of ways, it's, I mean, it's been developed for our survival, of course, and also for connection, for creating connection between people. And, um, yeah, and it's a means of transmitting values and ideals. And, um, of course, it's just like what we choose to, to do with it or the way that we maybe abuse it that can make it something bad. Or I think when it's used as a tool to oppress people, right, then it is something bad, something yeah. negative. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So we're, we're getting this kind of framework for our thinking and our, and our beliefs in mind. And mm-hmm. some of it's good, but there's definitely a lot that has maybe been bad and impacting us in ways we don't necessarily know or understand and ways mm-hmm. that we probably would rather not have. 
Mm-hmm. So, but the good news with this is that we can change that. You said our, our brain is malleable; it's, it's plastic. It can it can be rewired in a sense. Mm-hmm. So that that is the good news with this is that you can do this, but obviously it's got to be difficult since you're literally rewiring your brain in a way. <laughs> um, so, like, what do you tell people, or what would you say to someone who's like? In, one, if they don't believe this, I'm sure there are people who don't think, they might think, you know, how I was born, how I was raised, that's who I am, that's who I'll always be. You know, what would you say to them or what do you tell them? And also, like, what do you tell someone who maybe doesn't see the value in in trying to work through that pain to change some parts of their, their thinking or their, their construct? Mm-hmm. Um. <clears throat> So the way that that this has kind of I mean you can't force anybody who's not open to something right but the way that I have in the past gotten gotten through I guess to people who who don't necessarily see the value or whatever is to really um connect with them on the level of their own experience. It's really to try to understand um, sort of who they are and where they're coming from and what their fear is rooted in because ultimately resistance to any of this kind of stuff is rooted in fear. Um, And so it's really just about letting people share their lived experience and share their stories. And when you start asking the right questions, <laughs> people are like, oh, wait a minute. It, it's just, it's about engaging in just a really honest conversation and letting people feel free to express themselves. And sometimes that can be hard because what comes from that is them expressing things that I'm like, Oh God, I don't at all agree with that. Like, you know, <laughs> you know? but it's just, again, accepting that they've been shaped differently or they haven't been exposed to certain things or they, I mean, anything that they think or believe is a part of their conditioning. So it's just trying to understand what that has been and, Um, and connecting with them. I don't, I don't really know how else to say it. It's not like, it's not like I'm even trying to convince them that they should understand what I'm doing or what I think is important, but you just kind of plant little seeds that people later are like, wait, and they start thinking about it, you know? Yeah. So you have to give them an, an opportunity to, not just write off what you're saying right away and kind of get defensive, but to maybe lead themselves in a way to that understanding. Mm -hmm. Um, I I think maybe this is relevant. I think you mentioned like in in an article or a guest post saying how you have to provide an environment for people to be comfortable being uncomfortable. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, and so you do really try to do that with just letting them feel safe and and kind of leading them down that uncomfortable path while still feeling safe in a sense. Yes. yes. Okay. That yeah, I can imagine that's pretty difficult then with some people and and mm-hmm. yeah. Do you do you get people who like don't really know what they're in for when they start like trying to set something up or just think they might like learn a little bit about their culture and some beliefs and then suddenly like oh shit <laughs> like uh-huh. have you- yeah <laughs> yeah I mean I definitely think people especially because it's it's really only recently that I've even started to really talk about my approach in a way that's actually reflective of my approach. So I never really even, I think, was clear about what I was doing in in the way that I did my work. I was just like, yeah, oh, cross-cultural understanding and intercultural learning, and people have a certain idea of what that looks like. And then 
they're working with me and they're like, what the fuck? Like, this is not what I expected. And I think it's right. It's why those student groups were coming to me when I was in the university and saying like, nobody's doing anything like this. So it's because I was creating that space where they could share parts of themselves that they literally hadn't shared with their closest friends. Um, and there was just so much vulnerability and it was just like not expected. Like I ran this training. I lived in the Republic of, of Georgia for a few months this year and I ran a workshop series and it was all about like, Oh, better understanding other cultures and yourself and whatever. And people come with a set expectation of what that's going to be like. Right. And when we were doing sort of the reflection at the end of one of the workshops, everybody was like, um, this isn't what I expected. And I feel more like I came to therapy than I went than a training. Right. So yeah, it's definitely people don't expect it. And, and in some ways I think that was good because it, it really did allow me to connect with the people who I think would have been close to it from the beginning if they had known what they were getting themselves into. Yeah. <laughs> so it's like you almost have to kind of not deceive, but just like highlight certain parts of it. Or... Yeah. Well, it's I'm not doing what I say I'm doing. It's just that people aren't expecting me to do it in the way that I do because it's mm. not the way mo most people do it. Right. Yeah. So, so yeah, t I guess um, talk to me a little bit more about like, starting from within and kind of back to this like we project and um or we project our fears and and what are like um mind you know things we don't like about ourselves and so like going into people and not going into people but trying to like help people discover these these parts about themselves that maybe they've tried to hide or deny like are there methods you can do on your own to try to identify these things or are you going to like almost like sabotage yourself to not discover them or like to not have the courage to go after those without the help of someone else? Mm -hmm. um, well, I, I, I think that really depends on the person. I mean, there, right, there are definitely people who are not willing to be uncomfortable in that way to allow change in that way because that is scary I mean, change is scary for a lot of people and even I'm realizing as much as I've changed things in my life or changed aspects of identity or whatever it is I still have like this deep-seated fear of change in a way um so I think it really depends some people especially people who who really value sort of personal growth, which not everybody does, um, they may be willing to do that on their own, but there are other people who know they're just probably not going to ever do any of that stuff without support or without hitting rock bottom to the point where it's kind of like, if I don't change something, I'm not going to make it, you know? Yeah. That's a good point that, you know, not everyone is trying to develop personal growth or try to like improve themselves in a way mm -hmm. like is that hard for you when you see that or are you just are you at the point where you know like maybe they're where they need to be and if they aren't maybe they will eventually hit rock bottom and that's what it's going to take for them to try to change or to to reach that self-improvement or you know if that is, even is something we should be striving for mm -hmm. yeah I mean I just I think we're all on our own journey and we learn things when we're ready to and there are certain things that we can't see if we don't want to um there it's funny because several years ago I felt like over and over and over I had people being like there's really like a sadness in your eyes and and at that time I wasn't sad like I wasn't unhappy and I didn't understand why everybody was saying this to me um it just felt like it just felt like people were saying it a lot and I mentioned before that I do 
soul readings um, with this lady. And I asked about that. I said, why, why are people telling me I have sadness in my eyes? And she said it was because I was feeling sad for other people because I had a sadness that I was realizing things and I was understanding things and I was looking at other people and feeling sad that they weren't able to realize and understand the same things and that they were, that they could do something about it, that they could change something to be happier and they, and they weren't. And that there was like, that I had sadness and not that it was compassion. She said it was more like I had pity for them. Like I felt sorry for them in a kind of a negative way. Um, and that really made me think a lot about that and what it looks like for all of us to sort of be on our own path and figuring stuff out in our own time and have our own lessons that, um, you know, like I don't understand everybody else's lesson or lessons or everybody else's journey and what that's supposed to look like. And, um, maybe there are certain lessons that they're not supposed to learn until later because maybe they just have to be hit harder by certain things. Like, I don't know. That's not my, yeah, it's, it's like, I just have to accept people as they are. Yeah. That's gotta be a very difficult thing to like fully understand. Like once you do understand these tools and this, this access, I guess, to a different way of life and understanding that you've seen benefit yourself and other people, like how would you not like it, you know, you see other people and they're not doing that. It's like, come on, like, don't you mm -hmm. understand this? Like, you can, it can be better. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I've, now that I'm thinking about it, like, I've had times at that in my own life where just, like, it, for, on a very basic level, just, like, travel. Like, some, some people who don't want to travel or go do a two-week solo trip or something, I'm just like, but it will be great. Like, you'll do great. And so, mm -hmm. yeah, I, yeah, that's hard to hard to uh sit with i guess so what mm -hmm. what are soul readings exactly like what is is that like a part of the astrology type stuff that you said you've been getting into more or like is it very spiritual what are what are these readings <laughs> um yeah so well the soul readings i do they're with um a lady named donna she's in canada and she's you know highly intuitive she's very connected um, basically what she does is she connects to your spirit guides, to, um, your soul. I mean, she's, yeah, she's like basically just giving you messages from your soul. She actually has started a new reading. It's called, cause she does like questions of the soul and questions from the soul. And she'll even do something where like your soul is asking you questions, um, <laughs> Which is like, I did that one once and it was like, wow. Um, but yeah, it's just like she records, you ask a question or you can send like two questions and you can even ask about people. You can ask, what is this person's like purpose in my life in this lifetime? Um, and she just connects to the guides and she asks the question and then it's like they answer through her, which I know it sounds like really like, what the fuck? But <laughs> it's, it's really amazing because at least for me, it's always like when I hear it, it's like, yeah, these are things I know so deep within me and so intuitively, but that, you know, like all the crap gets in the way and I don't necessarily listen to that deep part of me. Um but yeah, and then when you ask questions about the people, that's when it's like, okay, I can't like deny like how does this like yeah, they just like understand the dynamic between you and this other person. So it's like what convinces a lot of people to believe in the reading. Because I've had I've recommended the readings to so many people who are like, uh like they're so weirded out by it that they that they're just like, I'm not going to invest my money in that like no and so I will be like I'm buying you the reading and I will gift it to them and then they're like oh my god I'm addicted like how am I ever going to not do this again so <laughs> yeah. oh my gosh so has that ever brought up like uh like a truth or something that maybe you weren't like 
prepared to hear or weren't really ready and you're like oh like that can't be true that can't be true or like kind of freak you out in a way um I mean I I wouldn't say that no because it's never like I don't know there have definitely definitely been times when it's like wow I was really unaware of that but it's never like Oh my God, like that's terrifying because it's not like scary. It's just like these things that are deep within you. So like, for example, one thing that you told me once that I just really wasn't expecting at all and wouldn't have thought on my own, but made so much sense when she was talking about it was that I have this limiting belief around opportunity and I I don't allow myself to associate opportunity with joy and so I don't necessarily pursue opportunities because I associate opportunity with pressure and imprisonment and stress and not as like something that can benefit me and that comes from my childhood and from all these years of like nothing ever being enough and feeling like so much pressure to be successful and so much pressure to do all the things and to do all the things perfectly. And, and it's like, so now I have, I almost like avoid opportunities because I tell myself that it's going to be bad for me instead of good for me, if that makes sense. Yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. So kind of sensing a theme here, like, a lot of things in our life come from our childhood, good or bad. Yeah. yeah. And, and you mentioned earlier uh, the phrase inner child. Um, mm-hmm. I don't know if that relates exactly, but could you kind of explain that concept a little bit more and or like just how it relates to our, our childhood and why so many of the things we do as adults maybe might stem from something from childhood? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so... <laughs> Our inner child beliefs are these these beliefs that we develop and sort of inherit from the time that we're children um, that later go on to limit us. Like, and we have we all have an inner child, so we all have this part of us that is like our. Yeah, our child self. And there's, I mean, I don't know if you've ever heard of like the holistic psychologist. She's amazing if you haven't. Is, um, is that like a, a brand, like her brand name is, or just holistic yeah, so psychologist? Her, her real name is Dr. Nicole Para. Um, but if you look her up on Instagram, she's a holistic psychologist and she has like over a million followers now or something because her whole thing um, is self healing. So she's, teaching people how to heal themselves and she talks a lot about doing inner child work and I've my the person who does my soul readings talks to me a lot about this too and it's it's just about almost reparenting the inner child within you so it's like look at yourself as a six seven year old um you know that what kind of messages did that child receive? How did that make them feel? Like imagine yourself as a six, seven year old. Um, and maybe when you got in trouble for something and how you you cowered in the corner. So like your present self can reparent that inner child in a way that maybe your real parent wasn't able to do. So what did you actually need then? And it's like, it's almost just like playing it out in your mind and in your heart of, of how would you, have responded to you and how do you love you and you know so like an inner child belief that for example that I developed because um my home was abusive like my dad was an alcoholic and he was pretty explosive and my mom thought that like really terrible punishments were going to teach me lessons but all those things did were teach me that it's not safe to be myself and it's not safe to express myself. And so I, so for so long 
would never tell anybody what I thought. Because if I were to say something wrong when I was young, um, that could have consequences, right? If I was to do something quote unquote wrong, even if it was just the innocent actions of a child, that could have consequences. So I developed this belief that it wasn't safe to express myself or to be myself. And so inner child work is really about like, how do I look at that crying little girl in the corner and tell her like, that's not true and it's okay and you are safe and you are loved. And it's like, yeah, like you reparent yourself through the relationship between your current self and your inner child self. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. So is it mostly like dealing with with pain from childhood then? Like does it does it reach a certain point where like like at what point is it still considered like inner child versus just like a bad experience you had in the past and like for example, like 10 years ago for me, it would have been when I'm 15. Is that like if something really bad happened then, is, is there like a cutoff of inner, like when it's considered inner child or is like just a traumatic experience? Like, is there a separation, I guess? Mm -hmm. um, is it based on age or? That's a good question because I don't really know. Um, <laughs> I, I don't know. I would say that because inner child is a lot about like your developmental years and a lot about how you are, you know, receiving and processing and internalizing the messages that like, well, yeah, how you internalize the messages that are given to you before you kind of know, even have the awareness to differentiate between like what is, could be right or wrong or what is fair or unfair or whatever. So, um, yeah, I would say it may be not any older than 10 to 12. So a lot of times when you're doing inner child work, it's really like with stuff that happened before the age of 10. Okay. So probably at a point where you don't necessarily have like the mental development to understand that whatever is happening to you is could necessarily be wrong and like is you just – that's happening and you're like, this is the way the world is and I have to live the rest of my life like this. Like you said, for example, even if you were in a different environment from home, you still felt afraid to be your true self because of those past punishments at home. So because the, because the feelings that I had as a child and the, the emotions that I brought up for me and the way that I internalized that, right. It became part of the way my brain was wired and that's why it continues to impact into adulthood because it becomes part of your subconscious. So even when you do develop the awareness to see like, okay, I know logically like looking at that situation now, that's not necessarily enough because it's ingrained. It's a, it's a pattern. It has become a pattern in your mind. So mm, I don't know if you've ever heard of, um, I forget who it was that, came up with it but they're like these the I think there are four of them the attachment styles that you that you have like in relationships with people and they're developed from your childhood the your attachment styles and like I have um oh my god what is it called avoidant ah <sighs> <laughs> I forget what it's called, but, but my type when I, cause you can do like a little assessment kind of thing to tell you what your attachment style is. And mine is like attachment avoidant. It's like this, it's like both of them. Sorry, this is, you're going to have to look this up. <laughs> I will. <laughs> but yeah. And when I think back to the way certain things happen in my childhood, like I think back to saying or doing something wrong. Then I think about my mom's reaction. I think about how terrified I was. Um, and and then I think about her feeling when she was feeling guilty. And then after like completely terrorizing me, she was like crying and hugging me and holding me and saying she was sorry. And that like really fucked up my head. Like because I I developed this almost like, okay, I 
I need somebody and I, and I need to be loved and I need to be, I need to get affection and whatever. But then at the same time, I'm like, Oh God, I need to avoid because that person's going to hurt me and that person's going to do this to me. And it's like constantly going back and forth. And that's like how I grew up like relating to people and, and how I interacted in like say romantic relationships. So that I carried that with me, that experience of like being really confused about what's happening. Like you hate me and then you love me and then you, you know, this, how that I internalized that. Yeah. Yeah. That's gotta be very confusing to have that coming from the same source and not right. knowing which, person is going to be there when something happens if it's going to be the angry person or the loving person and I yeah I can't even imagine the confusion and and uncertainty with that Mm -hmm. Um, (laughs) but um I guess with with identity that comes from this and and we talk about like changing identity and trying to forge different ones and I not improve upon them but just develop different ones in a way like it is it possible to be identity less like is it do you ever encounter someone who's just like i am no one i don't i don't <laughs> like i i don't like um i can't think of the word but like i'm not you know i don't consider myself as this identity this identity like i'm just i am who like ever changing like is that like possible is that even a good space to be in or like is it good to have an identity even if it's something that might not be perfect in a way Mm -hmm. not that there's a perfect identity but right um I mean I I don't know if it's possible because I think the just by the nature of how we make sense of the world around us and the way that we naturally categorize things and yeah, just how we understand things. I'm not, I'm not sure that it's possible to be identity list. Like you can claim that, but you're still somehow impacted by different things that create some sort of sense of identity. So like I was in a workshop I was leading a workshop and I had a guy there from Iran and he, he just really disliked a lot of stuff about Iran and a lot of stuff that had happened there. And, you know, we were talking about like cultural identity and how you have been impacted by your culture. And, and he was just, he just kept saying all the time, like, yeah, I'm not, but I'm not Iranian. Like I identify as a globalist and I don't identify as Iranian. And, And I was like, that's totally fine. Like, it doesn't have to be a part of the identity that you claim and you don't have to be proud of it. But it doesn't mean that being Iranian hasn't shaped you. Because even the fact that you reject what it means to be Iranian means that you are shaped by being Iranian. You know? (laughs) So it's like, (laughs) um, yeah, I mean, there's some part of you that, like, sees something you don't like and you reject it. And you're still responding to the influence that it's had on you. So it's like, I don't think you can be identity list. Like I think you can choose how you identify and you can accept certain aspects of identities and reject other ones because this is where we kind of get caught up in identity and how we allow it to sort of, surprised who we really are because we say oh like to be I don't know to be an American means I have to be xyz and some people like they really take that on and they really feel like I have to be all the things that it that an American is and they don't even think it's possible to reject parts of it um and so yeah I think it's just about like you can take what works for you and leave behind what doesn't and you can create your own sense of identity. But I really don't think that you can be without identity. Yeah. This seems like a little bit of a paradox. Like by saying you don't have an identity, you, that's kind of your identity. Then it's like, that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's, right. then uh, yeah. you're like the person who has no identity. And then you're like, 
I am I without identity, and that is an identity. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. So, so, um, like, do you think there's different levels of identity in a way, like, or, um, or, like, different depths of it? Like, one aspect being like, oh, I'm, uh, if you're a, whatever sports athlete like i'm a tennis player so i need to do this versus like a deeper culture maybe a deeper cultural one like i'm an american like are there different levels and are they are is one easier to recognize or change or like shift away from than the other Mm, so i think there are different types of identity um i think there are cultural identities which are the identities that are defined by the groups we belong to. So whether that's your nationality, your ethnicity, your race, your religion, these are all cultural identities. Then we have social identities. These are the identities that um, sort of tell you, not tell you, but they represent the role you have in relation to other people. So Let's say you're the goalie of a soccer team or the CEO of a business or you're the mother of a child or the husband of a wife. Like these are your social identities. And then you have your personal identities, which are um, like if you identify as introverted or you identify as athletic or you identify as curious or adventurous um, those are your personal identities and I don't think that that and mm, it's hard to say that any of them are more are like stronger or deeper than the others Um, I do think that our cultural identities carry so much weight because they are also means by which we define our worth or we derive our worth. So our belonging to different groups and what it means to be part of a group and to, to belong. Um, And so in that sense, I think in a lot of ways, those can, those identities can have the most influence on, who we think we're supposed to be because we are striving for the acceptance of the group members. Okay. And is that really where maybe the most disconnect can happen between your true self essentially and this self you're trying to personify and live up to because of that acceptance and connection to that group, whether or not maybe those are really well aligned, but if they're not, maybe that causes a lot of disconnect and, and discomfort in your life? Yes, I, I think so. Um, like for me, the most obvious example that always pops up in my, my mind is like somebody who identifies maybe as queer, but also identifies as a Christian or a Muslim or whatever. And that, that religion plays a really strong role in their life. Maybe they don't even identify as queer. Maybe they don't allow themselves to identify as queer because of that other identity and the expectations that they feel they have to live up to because of that or who they're supposed to be because of that or who they're not allowed to be because of that. Um, And of course that looks different. Like there are, let's say like, Christian communities that are accepting of that, but then there are others that are not. And if you, and if you feel a certain way and you're part of this group that tells you it's wrong to feel this way, then you're obviously going to try to push that down if you want to be accepted by the group. Right. So Mm -hmm. yeah, I think a lot of self-denial happens because of our cultural identities and our desire to be, accepted it's crazy thinking about just so many of the issues that have come up in the world throughout history are kind of focused around identity whether you know religion or your national identity or 
whatever. It's it's crazy how big of a influence that can really be in your life. And if you like don't question it in a sense or don't realize it's can change or just maybe it's not who you really are like it kind mm-hmm. of all dissolves and just like eh, maybe it's a little bit of bullshit like why are we fighting over this or i don't know mm-hmm. and co- like mm-hmm. yeah i don't know <laughs> actually like my research in graduate school was all about uh intergroup conflict as a result of group identity <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> okay, so you're well versed on that then. <laughs> yeah. But so when you do like break away from an identity or even like break some of this cultural conditioning maybe that that you've had in your life like cuz obviously a, a big part of being human is connection, you know. I think everyone wants connection with with any like just in their life. So if you are getting that connection through an identity, say, like we've been talking about religion, which is an easy one to to point out. But so say you are part of a religion group and a lot of your connection and maybe social life and things are through that, then suddenly you break away from that or cultural conditioning. Like, does that, how does that break your feelings of connection and like self-worth or part of that group in a sense? Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Well... If you remember, I kind of touched on this at the very beginning because I had this experience um, that I that I did identify as a Christian and I belong to that identity and to that that group. And when I started to really just understand more about our cultural and social constructs, and I really started to assess what I believed versus what I had been taught. Um, it didn't make sense to me anymore. And it wasn't that I rejected the idea of a God or it wasn't that I rejected certain principles, I guess, within Christianity, but it was that it was that I didn't accept the framework as ultimate truth that I came to see all religions as different paths to the same thing. And I didn't like that we were being taught in Christianity that it was the only way and that there's just like this big narrative around like the way, the truth and the life, which is a quote taken from the Bible, which drives me crazy because, (laughs) because that is translated from the Greek and it's a miss understanding of the translation because that's just how we talk in Greek. We say the, 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 it doesn't mean the only, but anyways, (laughs) (laughs) Um, so, (laughs) so for me, it was like, okay, this, like to hold on to this approach doesn't make sense to me. And so I, I don't know, my way of looking at sort of religion or spiritual connection or understanding of who God is and what that means, it changed. And when that happened and when I voiced that, when I sort of was open about that, I lost a lot of people in my life, a lot. Um, And I had people that I thought were friends say awful things to me and I just, I really questioned the, like, were these people ever really my friends or were we only connected because of this identity, because of this group that we belong to? And did they actually, like, accept me as a person or was it just about what I believed? Because then, like, they weren't really friends anyway. Um, but this, like it shook me up a lot because it was really hurtful and it was painful and I definitely lost a lot of connection. And it's interesting because in another soul reading that I had, um, (laughs) 10 years after that, um, when I was starting my business and when I was thinking about really sharing my sort of unconventional approach to this work, Um, what came from the reading was that she told me that I was so afraid to share my ideas about this work 
and how I want to do the work because of the experience I had when I was 21, when I walked away from my religion and every, and like all these people turned their back on me. And she said, I would just been carrying this like internalized fear that if I, if I stand in my truth and people don't like it or people don't agree with it, they will abandon me and I will be alone. And so it's, it, yeah, it, it was really impactful because obviously I carried it with me. Um, but at the same time, it allowed me to see that a lot of the connection I had was based on something really superficial. And the people who stayed with me through that did so because they accepted me for who I was. And in the end, belonging isn't belonging if it's based on something superficial it's based on being accepted for who you are and true belonging is accepting yourself for who you are and so I really just kind of learned what real connection means to me and that I can find connection with people who understand and accept me and it doesn't have to be based on belonging to some group, you know? Um, yeah. Jeez. Yeah. <laughs> that's intense. I mean, you've, <laughs> so in a way, yes, it can break some connection in, in that, in that part of the human experience, but it's almost a good pain to have in a way. If like, mm -hmm. obviously going through it, it's probably can't imagine how difficult that is. And to lose so many people who you thought were so close to you, but in the long term, I mean, are you grateful for that? Like, is it, do you look back at that now and you're like, you know, who, mm -hmm. yeah. 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 So now when you're in the relationships you make now, like, are you able to better identify that? Or like, do you feel like you might kind of have a better sense of when something's just like, mm, this doesn't feel as real or like, I don't know what this person's motives are. Or is that just kind of something you got to keep going through and you might keep getting hurt and who knows? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, at least for me, it's like I, the older I get, the less tolerance I have for just, <laughs> I don't, I don't know. I want to say quote unquote meaningless connection because I feel like a lot of the connection we have with people is meaningless because it's really just based on proximity or based on circumstance or I don't know. It, it's, yeah, I just, it's bad, I think in a sense, because I, I can tell pretty early on, like, this is going to be a meaningful connection or it's going to be really surface level. And if I sense that it's going to be surface level, I'm just like, mm, no, like I, I just have zero desire to invest anything into it. And I just feel like people can see that. And, <laughs> <laughs> and maybe that's not great. Like, I don't know. I probably give off a really bad impression, but it's like, no, I'm not going to waste my time or my energy or invest in things that I, that I know don't really mean anything. And that's not to say that like things can't evolve and change or, you know, obviously you're the first impression you have of somebody isn't always the best one, but, um, yeah, I think I can just, I can just sense it out now for yeah. the most part. Yeah. And even if not right away, after a while, I'm like, yeah, okay, no, it's not, it's not worth it. <laughs> yeah, that's a good point, too, is, like, meaningful connection. Like, I guess not everything needs meaning, and you aren't always going to develop those relationships, like you said, and if, like, that'd almost be overwhelming if you did, to, because, you mm -hmm. know, usually in a meaningful relationship, you're trying to really keep up with that person or provide support to each other, and if every person you meet is going to be that relationship that might be overwhelming in a sense yeah. <laughs> um, but it is like those are the ones that really matter in the long run I guess and are gonna help you through life and 
and through mm-hmm. uh, through everything. But uh, but like you you mentioned, uh, you know, my time is valuable. I'm not going to waste my time. And mm-hmm. we're in this individualistic culture, <laughs> and where we uh, we look at time like <laughs> like money, and uh, yeah. <laughs> comes full circle (laughs) it's true because if I were to take the same like when I do take that similar sort of mentality in Greece it's just like oh my god like it's shameful you know it's it's just so different because of the way people relate to people and community and relationship and and you are expected to fulfill like a lot of sort of social obligations and do things in a certain way to show that you were fulfilling these social obligations. And it's, <laughs> it's a totally different mindset for sure. Yeah. Do, do you feel like at least understanding that about yourself helps? Like you can kind of like prepare yourself for those things better. Whereas like if you didn't know and you were just like going into these situations where maybe it was going to be, you know, kind of a, a full night of more surface level interaction, like you'd be miserable, but now you at least can kind of prepare to be miserable or like at least try to have like one good, really meaningful conversation or something. Yes, I I can prepare. I mean, I still kind of set boundaries and set limits and I don't adhere to all the expectations. Um, And in, in a way, like if people take that the wrong way, like ultimately I'm okay with it. (laughs) Um, because if I really did everything the way I was quote unquote supposed to, I really would be miserable. Um, but yes, I, I can prepare myself and be like, okay, so I haven't gone to visit my aunt in three days. Like it's time to go visit my aunt because, you know, she was probably freaking out two days ago that I didn't come. (laughs) Like, so yes, I know that there are certain certain ways that that I can live up to the expectations, but not to the extent that I'm expected to. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it's hard. I I feel kind of the same way sometimes. It's like other people might value those things more than you do, and if you know they mean something to you, then sometimes you have to do that, which is yeah. very challenging sometimes. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but yeah, so so I guess a little bit of a segue talk about kind of being miserable in that situation, but, um, Mm -hmm. there was an, an article, um, that I think you were kind of highlighted in or wrote about, I think the website was postcards from Steph and Mm -hmm. one of the questions or your answer was, um, the question was what you what are you really proud of that you've done or something? And you mentioned that you're more proud of your qualities than things you've actually done. And one of Mm -hmm. these qualities being around pain and your ability to like, just be able to sit with pain instead of trying to fix it necessarily or run from it or hide from it. Um, And so I'm, I'm curious, like why is this a quality that you admire about yourself so much being able to sit with pain? Mm Mm-hmm because I think that one of the things that we are taught to do and one of the things that um, is just we perceive as being easier or more comfortable is to run from our pain, um, to escape it somehow, to avoid it, to distract ourselves from it. And I think that when we do that, it ultimately manifests itself in destructive ways, um, in ways that really hurt us and hurt other people. And I, yeah, I'm proud of the fact that I can sit with it and I can be really fucking miserable with it and really uncomfortable and I can process it and I can see like, what is it trying to teach me? What is the lesson here? Um, and how do I apply that? And, and then I can move through it and, and hopefully develop less sort of mechanisms, um, to process it in other ways that are more harmful or more destructive. So 
um, yeah, I'm proud of that because I think it's not an easy thing to do. And I think it's, yeah, just not a very appealing thought, is it? Like, I'm just going to sit with this pain. But... <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. And that's not like, yeah, it seems you are using that more as a teacher and able to, like you said, you're able to learn from it instead of just shy away from it. Mm -hmm. Um, so, and that is, like you said, I don't think that is something that is easy for yeah. most people. I mean, the natural, maybe not natural, but most human reaction is to avoid pain or to not seek it out at least, or to try to avoid it altogether, like fix it immediately. So, you know, mm -hmm. how, if someone admires that quality as well, but doesn't feel like they're great with it, or they do a lot of their decisions based off avoiding pain, um, you know, how can we try to change that or to be okay with sitting with that pain? Mm -hmm. I think to be okay with it, you really have to really come to a place of awareness of like, in the long term, term that's going to serve you, it's going to help you to sit with it. Like it's really going to suck during that time. But if you don't sit with it, it's going to carry on for years and years and years in different masked forms. Um, and so to sit with it and transform it into a lesson is yes, to suffer for a little while, but then to be able to move on instead of to carry the hidden suffering throughout with you. Um, and I think sitting with pain, it's also a lot about what's happening in your body. It's being really mindful of, of where the pain is present in your body and how you feel it. Because um, so often when we do run away from pain, we are inhibiting certain emotions, um, and feelings. And when we inhibit them, we transform them into these defense mechanisms that are the harmful, destructful things, destructive things. So recognizing where the pain is in your body and what it feels like and what actual emotion it is, because it's representing an emotion. But when we don't sit with it, we don't allow ourselves to feel the emotion that it's trying to get us to feel. So I also recommend that you look up the change triangle. It's, it's something used in therapy. Um, and it's all about sort of this process we go through of suppressing or repressing our core emotions like fear or sadness um, and how they are expressed through anxiety or depression and how those become like we develop defense mechanisms from there. Um, and a lot of that is just about like, yeah, being present with your body and being able to, to just sort of sit with whatever emotion is there and to learn to recognize what it is instead of try to avoid it. And to eventually like, to eventually fix it though, right? Or like, I I guess, what's the, like, I want to make sure the distinction is clear between like um, sitting with pain in a way of just like ignoring it, like for, like back to inner child stuff, you know, maybe someone's been sitting with pain for 10 years from something out of their childhood, but is that like different than sitting with pain and like facing it head on in a sense? Like, and on that side, it seems like more ignoring it because you don't want to sit with it and face it. Whereas in the way it just seems like you're describing it, it's more like you're able to sit with it and examine it in order to understand it and either like move on or improve something or like let it go instead of just like sitting with it to just let it hang around. I don't right, know, yeah. right. Yeah, you don't sit with it for it to like fester and like seep into you kind of thing yeah it's about sitting with it to be 
mindful of, of what it's trying to tell you to be present with yourself to, yeah, to like understand where, where it's coming from and how you can release it and let it go. Okay. Okay. Yeah. That makes more sense or that, yeah, that distinction. Okay. Um, yeah, that's, that's a hard quality. I understand then why you, uh, why you're proud of that because, you know, like I said, kind of the natural human reaction is probably to avoid that. And, uh, it's uncomfortable and you have Mm -hmm. to face a lot of different things about, about yourself or your situation or, or something you need to, uh, to look at more. Mm -hmm. Um, and then when you talk about the, like where it's at in your body, Mm -hmm. like physical or like, I, you know, I don't, I don't quite understand that either. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. So yes, it can be physical. So are you, are you feeling something like kind of in your stomach area? Are you feeling it in your chest, like in your heart? Are you, where is your tension? Where, like, do you feel it in your throat? You know, a lot of times when we're really upset and we're trying not to cry and this hurts right here, um, it's because it wants to come out and we're not letting it. Um, and so, yeah, it's just about being aware of, of where it is in your body and then sort of connecting to what is this? Is this fear? Is this sadness? Right. Mm-hmm. Okay. Hmm. I think it's um uh who who said it? Ah, I can't think of sorry, I had a, a good good uh phrase that went along with that, but I can't remember it. <laughs> sorry. It's um, okay. But I guess so then um switching strat or switching things a little bit let's look to the future a little bit more and hopefully areas of your life that won't bring you pain not to (laughs) not to necessarily avoid them but hopefully to bring you great joy and excitement and uh and fulfillment and meaningful connection um so the first thing that you mentioned is coming up for you or earlier we talked about right at the beginning of the podcast is this upcoming trip and workshop that you're leading in greece um, in August, 2020. So before we, I like ask some about the details of that and learn more about that. I'm curious, um, with your Greek heritage and and culture and, um, just studying of anthropology and history throughout the world. Um, what is a meaningful lesson or philosophy that you've learned through your Greek, um, heritage or from like Greek culture? Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> it's funny because I actually think a big part of why I feel okay to sit with pain is because it's like something I, I gained from Greek culture. Um, because I don't, you can't see it, I think as a visitor, but when you are from Greece, when you can understand Greek music, when you can understand the way that people talk about relationships or connection or feeling, it's like Greeks very much embrace pain and they embrace what is uncomfortable and to allow yourself to feel it and to feel all the hurt and to feel all the anger and to just let it like exist in you and then to like release it it's and that's like you see you know when people I don't know if if I'm sure you're aware like Greeks dancing and breaking plates and there's a lot about release in that and it's a lot about like letting things go and just like feeling so intently and and Greeks are very passionate they're just like all in their feels um and expressing that and I think I think that's something I've always loved about Greece because I one of those comparisons I always made was how I felt like Greeks were so expressive and just so open with what they felt versus I felt like Americans really repressed their feelings and really pushed things down um and so that's something that I've always loved 
about Greek culture and Greece. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, that's that's mm-hmm. cool. And, yeah, I can see why de- America's definitely more the opposite and uh, why that'd be difficult. Um, so you're bringing a group of people to Greece and mm-hmm. – um, you know, how many days is this? What's the purpose of it? Um, are you traveling a lot? Is it mostly intensive workshop and a cool island and good backdrop? Or are you exploring and traveling as well as doing this? And, um, you know, what are you hoping that uh, people who are going on this will get out of it? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so it is a week long trip. We are visiting. Athens, the island of uh, Dinos, and the island of, what's the other one there, Naxos? <laughs> I almost don't remember. Yeah. Yes. No. <laughs> um, and so we, there's definitely a lot of fun stuff planned, like a lot of, um, there's hiking, there's obviously food as a focus, there are cultural activities, um, like different tours and learning about history and creating art. Um, and there's a sailing trip. So there's a lot of that sort of like adventure and cultural immersion. But at the same time, every day I will lead a workshop. And it's almost like um, a shortened intensive version of the work that I do with people. So it kind of follows this series of becoming aware of your conditioning, reconnecting with yourself, identifying and working through limiting beliefs and, and just like it's about exploring Greece, but it's also about coming home to yourself. So yeah, it's all the things wrapped in one. <laughs> <laughs> and are you is are you going to be with a big group? Are there a lot of other people there? Um, I yeah how how many people are you expecting to come on this? Yeah, so we have um, we're going to try to fill between eight to ten spots, and then there are two of us, myself and um, Dimitri. He owns a tour company in Greece, and he's the one that sort of is running all the logistics and like he'll be along with us, but he's has planned all of the adventure activity stuff Uh and uh, doing all the workshop, uh, inner work stuff. Um, so yeah, depending on, on the spots that we fill and including us, then there will be 10 to 12 people total. Okay. And I, I did see that you actually, or you have to do some sort of application. Are you, are people going on this supposed to have like a certain, um, like base knowledge or level of understanding or like, are you looking for a specific type of person or like, um, why the application, I guess. Mm -hmm. So the application is, it's really basic and straightforward. It's not extensive at all, but really the purpose of it is like, I don't want just anybody to come on and sign up for it and then maybe not be aware of, of what it really is or think it's just like only a carefree vacation or like basically the application is just for me to get a sense of why do you want to come on this trip? Um, what do you think you'll gain from it? I kind of want, to be sure that people understand that there is also inner work involved in it. Because I think if, if they have no intention of really engaging or participating in that aspect of it, then one, they may be really disappointed with the experience when they have to like sit through that stuff. Um, and also that would negatively impact other people who are there to do that as well. So I just want to make sure that it's the right fit for people. Um, that's really the purpose of the application. Okay, that makes sense. You want mm-hmm. to make sure the uh, the community there is right. And, yes. uh, <laughs> yeah. It's, uh, I wonder if, do you agree with this, that like sometimes it's almost easier to 
like open up or be your true self when you're around people you've never met before, like in an environment like that, because there's no expectations of who you should be. Like you get that a lot when you're traveling. I get, I think when you're in a new area, it's like, I may never see this person again. I don't, I can kind of be who I want to be right now. Or like, I don't know. Do you feel like that is true at all? Yes, for sure. And I think when a lot of times when we're around people, we already know we're even unconsciously, um, behaving in certain ways because we're, we just are almost programmed to do that with them. It's, it's almost like, you know, when you, when you're home with your parents, you kind of operate in a certain way and you are triggered by certain things. And then that's not the case when you're away from home and you're almost like, kind of different and then you come back home and you're almost like right back to who you were when you were 15 (laughs) that kind of and so I even I've even stated like on the website about the Greece trip that we we really recommend that people come on their own that they don't come with a friend or with a family member or a partner because it could not necessarily like it's a given, but it could impact the experience and their ability to be completely open. Um, and not, and because it could also happen unconsciously, subconsciously that they sort of hold back or hold on to certain patterns. And so it's just a way for people to feel really free. Yeah. yeah. I, I like that you specify that because and it doesn't like create a group right out of the gate. Like if right. one person, two other friends come, it's like you're obviously going to gravitate towards hanging out with that person more, or like partnering yeah. up with them or stuff. So, yeah, uh, yeah, okay. And so that sounds really exciting. Is this is your like one of the first times you've done something like this, or, or at least in a setting like Greece or like this extensive of of a thing? Mm-hmm. Um. Well, I mentioned before that I would take uh, students abroad as part of my last job. And even though it wasn't like meant to be part of the experience, I still uh, brought some of that sort of self-development work into it in a way. Um, but it is like the first time that, yeah, I'm. it's in Greece for one, which is a place that I obviously have a different kind of connection to. Um and where I just am in complete control of what I can create and provide. And so um, I'm really excited about that because I just have so many ideas and I'm excited to have a chance to implement them, I guess. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that sounds incredible. And I, uh, I hope it goes as well as you are planning it to go. Um Thanks. And so if, if someone's not able to, to get across the world, if, assuming they're in the U.S. And, or, uh, or make that happen for the dates, um, what else can they do to interact with you? You mentioned you have a website and you do some coaching. Um, mm-hmm. Is there any other programs or things that you have going on that someone could join or try to be a part of? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so I, I do private coaching, like the work – kind of everything we've been talking about through this whole thing with people one-on-one. Um, I also currently offer, I don't know if I will next year or not, but I currently offer this intercultural intensive, which is, um, a session I also talked about earlier where people can take this assessment that measures sort of how well you engage cross-culturally in these different aspects. But, I still use that to go deep into the conditioning and the limiting beliefs. Um, So that's also like a one-on-one thing. Uh, I am planning to, to host a group program at the start of next year, which is, which would be a three month long program for six to eight people to kind of go through this process together um, and be coached by me as a group and have the accountability and support of one another. Um, and yeah, we'll see. I'm kind of going to be doing a lot of work in December to, I don't know, to really rework a lot of what I'm doing 
And so I may have new services. I don't know what that's going to look like yet. So we'll see. Okay. Is that group thing? Is it, you said that's three months long. Is that online? Is that in person? Yeah, it's virtually. Um, okay. We'll do group calls like through Zoom and we'll have a Facebook group and there will be like Q&As and, and guided reflection activities and workbooks that I will give people and stuff like that. So. Okay. Yeah, I thought I thought it was going to be an in-person thing at first. I'm like, oh, wow, you're, uh, people got to <laughs> take a quick sabbatical from work. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Move to Puerto Rico. <laughs> yeah, uh, that's fun. really exciting, though. That's, I mean, it's fun to, uh, to switch up your projects and kind of experience new things and obviously being able to help people in, in that t- sort of a group setting and have that really small community that, uh, like we talked about, being able to create that safe environment where you can uh kind of be uncomfortable and be okay with it yeah yeah Yeah. so um if people are interested in in learning about this or just want to read more of your writings or find out more information about you uh what is the the best places to find you whether your website or social Mm -hmm. um yeah so my website is a great place to learn a bit more about my, my story, my background, and my services, um, which is elenapapadopoulos.com. Um, I will link and... that in the, uh, in the blog post in case people yes. are confused how to spell that. Right, exactly. Um, and I'm really, I'm really only active on Instagram, and sometimes I'm not that great at that. Um, but, yeah, so Instagram is the other place, and my handle is Lena Papadopoulos there, too. So, mm-hmm. All right, wonderful. And uh, before we kind of wrap up today, we're, I just looked, we're, we're over two hours right now, which is always surprising when you realize how long you've actually been uh, having a conversation. It flies by sometimes. But, um I guess is there is there anything that we didn't talk about today or a question I didn't ask or we weren't able to bring up that you really would like to highlight or to uh to leave our listeners with some final thoughts? Um no, I don't think so. I think you did a great job of asking great questions, Lee. Um yeah, I just I don't think so. I I think if I just had like any sort of words of wisdom (laughs) um yeah it would just be that we are all inherently worthy of love and deserving of love and acceptance and there is nothing that we should do or have to do or are supposed to do to be worthy of it so we can't like fail at it we can't mess it up somehow it's just we are worthy inherently and so um yeah I just I really just want people to believe that and to accept themselves because I think that's what we struggle with the most um yeah all right Mm -hmm. wonderful well I hope people take that to heart and uh hopefully this conversation (laughs) maybe help them either continue on that path of self-discovery and self-awareness or to uh, be the spark that makes them start to ask those tough questions and to start looking inward. So thank you so much for, for sharing uh, so much of your personal story and so openly and, uh, and vulnerably. I know that's something you care a lot about deeply and uh, we actually didn't have a chance to really touch on too much in the explicit words, but it's definitely uh, kind of underlying a lot of our conversations. So Thank you for that. I really appreciate it. And uh, thank you, everyone, for listening. Hopefully you're still with us at this point. (laughs) And uh, reach out to Lena at her site or Instagram if you have any further questions. And uh, until next time, thank you. Thanks.